scrap metal and asked me if I could get rid of a load of lead, lead ingots. But Grimes was the wrong man to ask. By 1991, his son Jason had become hooked on heroin. It had left Grimes with a vendetta against drug dealers. Not that the man selling him the ingots knew this. He was telling me all the situation on what happened, about the drugs being in, in the bottom of them, what sort of boxes they was in, little steel boxes and all that. And I related all that back to the customs. Former robber Paul Grimes had turned informer. When he learned a second import of cocaine was imminent, he tipped off customs, who pounced on arrival. They seized 150 million pounds worth of cocaine and arrested a dozen suspected drug traffickers, including Warren. In April 1993, the case came to court, but there was a huge problem. Defendant Brian Charrington was a police informer. The judge ruled evidence against Warren was inadmissible and instructed the jury to acquit. When they got found not guilty, it was a bit of a gobsmack for me. I thought he was, he was going away, but what happened with the customs, I don't know, I just haven't got a clue how they cocked up on it. Warren was free to go. As for Paul Grimes, by turning supergrass, he'd committed the biggest no-no of the criminal world. See, he's been in grass and been in grass. See, I've never grassed on a robber, or what I used to, but a drug dealer is an entirely different person. They are killing people slowly, and them and making money out of it. And the likes of them people shouldn't be allowed to do that. Grimes had good reason to be unrepentant. In the run-up to the trial, his son Jason had died of an overdose on his 21st birthday. For police and customs, Warren's acquittal was a disaster. Resources were now poured into catching Warren and smashing his organization. Cop Mike Keogh was at the heart of a huge new operation, codenamed Crayfish. So this is an activity that takes a lot of planning for their organization as well as ours. So the planning takes place over a number of months, sometimes in, 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 in years. For two years, intelligence was gathered that put Warren at the center of Merseyside's drug supply. But police lacked definitive evidence. Then events on Liverpool's streets took a deadly turn. In May 1995, a businessman named David Ungi was shot dead in the south of Liverpool. Whilst his family deny Ungi was an underworld figure, his assassination sparked a gang war. Following that event, there was a lot of tensions uh, around um, Liverpool between various factions. And as a result of that, it was very difficult for business to, to carry on. Almost overnight, criminals began settling scores with guns. In response, armed police officers were put on routine patrol for the first time in Britain. Fearing disruption to his operations, Warren decided to disappear. But his choice of destination would prove his undoing. Holland. Tom Dreesen, Deputy Director of Europol, is one of the most senior figures in Europe's fight against drugs. Back in the 90s, he worked for the Dutch police when Curtis Warren wandered into his patch. What he thought is that Holland is a very tolerant, easy country to live. He could uh, have a nice uh, life over here. And he thought that uh, when he escaped the UK, there won't be any investigation towards him. We saw that he, he was a smart guy. and He chose the place to stay very carefully. House alone in a, in a little village called Sassenheim. He was somewhere under the radar, so he believed. Smart, perhaps. But Warren wasn't aware of a crucial difference between British and Dutch law. And in Holland, we have the advantage that when somebody is a severe suspect, with the permission of our court, we can wiretap people. For five months, Warren's phone was tapped, and the results were jaw-dropping. 
Police heard Warren's casual threats to blow up rival gangsters. They learned a senior Merseyside cop had passed confidential information onto Warren's associates for money. And that Warren had links with the world's biggest cocaine exporters in Colombia. Once the Dutch had gathered enough evidence, they raided Warren's home and the home of his gang, 30 kilometers away. At the moment we were arrested, we saw that they had hand grenades and automatic weapons under their uh, pillow and next to their bed, so that was a dangerous operation. This time, there would be no escape for Warren. He was convicted of drug trafficking and running a criminal organization and jailed for 12 years in Holland. Back in the UK, the reverberations were huge. Detective Chief Inspector Elmore Davis became the most senior cop jailed for corruption in nearly 30 years. Whilst Operation Crayfish led to the arrests of 129 men, and officers began recovering Warren's money, which estimates put as high as 300 million pounds. It had been a remarkable journey for Liverpool crime. From the 1950s, when safe blowers were top dogs, to the 90s, when a Liverpool criminal was said to be worth a quarter of a billion pounds. And the villains who helped shape the underworld have taken very different paths. Charlie Seeger is now a successful writer and penning his fourth book. Stephen French has renounced his former life and now campaigns against gang violence. I now run the Increase the Peace programme. I speak to, to dozens and dozens of kids up and down the country, and lots of them, they want out. They just don't know how to get out. And things like this, yeah, will keep kids off the streets. Paul Grimes went on to inform on a second major drug importer and had to leave Liverpool. But there has been a couple, a couple of threats and all that. I've had to move addresses and all that, carry on. So people didn't know where I lived and what have you. And that was it. I just had to protect myself. And Michael Showers emerged from prison in 2000 and mourns the area he once supplied drugs to. What you see today, it's a war zone compared with what, what it was. I mean, it's been totally decimated. As for Liverpool itself, whilst the population has halved from its peak in the 1930s, the long decline may be over. The city has recently gone through something of a renaissance and is no longer reliant on its docks. But then nor is the drug trade, as the likes of cannabis are increasingly grown in Liverpool. Just as in the 1950s, the criminals are always trying to stay one step ahead, and the police are still working hard to keep up. They work jolly hard to succeed, um, the police service, and certainly here in this city, uh, which has had its problems, but gladly, through a lot of hard work, determination, uh, you're seeing the good results. Get up close and personal with Great Whites in brand new Shark Men, starting next Monday at 8. Stay tuned for Crash of the Century.